Hi everyone. My name is Dina Daisy Aberline. I'm an Italian Canadian comic artist and creator of the comic series Sunrise Blossom, which you can read on Webtoon, Tapas, or if you'd like, support on Kickstarter, which is live now, funded in two hours, project we love, and it's going brilliantly. This is Two Geeks Talking. I hope you'll enjoy. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. She is, of course, uh, the creator of uh, a new comic that I've just started to read. And I, it's a wonderful story, great batch of characters, beautiful art style. And uh, she is a wonderful person uh, creatively as well, too, from what I've stalked briefly on social media as well too we're joined today by nia daisy Everline. how are you doing today <laughs> i'm good how are you doing good doing good i love first timers on the show because it gives me something new to read it gives me something new to see uh what's happening in the world of comics and what's happening in the world of entertainment and i'm, I'm glad you decided to stop on the show so i greatly appreciate that as well too so Thank for you those for having that, me oh you're, you're very welcome <laughs> For those that don't know anything about, of course, I haven't even said the name of the comic because that's how silly I am today. <laughs> Sunrise Blossom comic creator, Nita Daisy Arbeline. So tell us what this comic is all about. Well, if you like harpies, mm -hmm. if you like falcons, if you like drama, if you like girls kissing, then Sunrise Blossom is definitely the type of comic that you might enjoy. So Sunrise Blossom is a coming of age story about a young falcon harpy abandoned by her birth mother and raised by a family of owls. While traveling with her sister to learn about human culture, they have an argument and Ivy is separated from her, only to be picked up by a human woman, Violet, who helps her discover herself and bloom into womanhood. But it's only after a dramatic turn of events that Ivy discovers her romantic feelings for her human companion. And after the dramatic ending of volume one and volume two, Ivy spends some time with a kind, old, fatherly, kind of sexy man. <laughs> but when his real daughter returns, it's time for Ivy to return to her love interest. Well, that is the, the most succinct summary I've ever had on the show. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. that. And it, it's a great tale overall here i mean you've, you've done two volumes it's on webtoons it's it's on tapas it's you're out there which is wonderful to see looking at then the world that you've created for this what did you draw from to create the world there is a manga series that kind of gave me the push at the beginning uh mostly and like it, they're not very similar world building wise and and like character wise but there was this series that i watched when i was a teenager called daily life with monster girls normally uh that type of story is a type of story that i abhor the most because it, it's a harem series uh there's so like there's lots of women you know like pining for one guy all the women like barely have any personalities they're heavily sexualized, heavily objectified. And normally I hate that in, uh, in a story. Hi, sorry. Kitty. Okay. The characters, the cast, they were so pretty and they were so cute and so colorful. Like that, that like I've seen the entire series multiple times. I know all of the characters, theme songs. And it's like, I, I really started to enjoy content with like half animal uh, creatures or like monster girls. I wanted my own pretty much. And after some brainstorming, I started working on Sunrise Blossom. What is the most misunderstood aspect about the monster girl genre? There isn't much really to be misunderstood there uh, because normally the monster girl genre is monster girls. So, you know, like centaurs, mermaids, vampires, zombies, but sexy pretty much that's normally all there there is there is to it because it is so it is a a, a community a, a fandom it, a type of content that is so heavily sexualized that many people when thinking about monster girls automatically think ah yes it's something sexy but that's not always the case like for example in sunrise blossom and in many 
other different types of uh, comics, series, books, animated series. It's nice content, you know, with nice characters that doesn't necessarily revolve around sex. And also, cats are always welcome on the show, so uh, don't. And worry. to think that I closed the door to let them out, but apparently she was already in. <laughs> there you go. Then, looking at your your journey in creating Sunrise Blossom, I, I take it Volume Two is not the end of the series. You're you're continuing on. You have lots more to do. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, what is the hardest part about being a creative person in comics? Is it creating the story? in the beginning, middle, or end? Or is it the art at the beginning, middle, or end? Well, uh, I can't really think of a particularly hard step of the process, mostly because creating comics is something that I've been doing for several years at this point. So I've been doing it nearly nonstop for about six years now. And so I do it out of habit, pretty much, because mm -hmm. now creating comics is second nature to me at this point. The writing, scripting, and the storyboarding part, I hate them so much. <laughs> Mostly because they're the part that require like the most brain energy. Like I actually have to like turn everything off and focus when I'm scripting or doing storyboards. Well, pretty much everything else I can do with my brain turned off. Like if I have the storyboards, like the thumbnails all done, then I can turn my brain off and go like on autopilot for the rest of the creation process. Is this your first Kickstarter campaign? Because that's something we haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> uh, Kickstarter, yes. Crowdfunding, no. So I crowdfunded volume one on Indiegogo. And I, I went for Indiegogo mostly because it was a platform that most of my creative friends used, more familiar with it. Uh, but there were several issues, uh, not several, there were a few issues along the way. Biggest one being the fact that Indiegogo declined the credit cards for a lot of people. Oh. So easily I could have made something like a hundred more bucks on the campaign than I initially made. And so for the second campaign, which is for volume one and two, I tried moving over to Kickstarter and so far it's going a lot better. It's so much better than how the Indiegogo campaign went. So what lessons did you learn then between running the Indiegogo campaign and the Kickstarter campaign? What did you learn and what did you maybe change to make this more successful? I Well, I didn't really change much uh, as much as I did more. Okay. So with the first campaign that I had a couple of friends who already had experienced crowdfunding. And so they kind of like held my hand and guided me through part of the process. And they also introduced me to uh, a few people who did uh, like, I don't know, interviews, podcasts, you know, focusing on indie comics and, and things like that. And so with the Indiegogo, it was mostly also a bit like testing the waters of this kind of market, you know, uh, experimenting, a lot of trial and error. With the second campaign, so with the, the current Kickstarter campaign, I pretty much took everything that I learned from the first one and I added on top of it. So I already had the contacts that I had earned from the first campaign, and then I did further research, you know, and searched for further recommendation, uh, reached out to a lot more people for both promotion, cross promotion with, with other creators, uh, marketing, you know, like experimented with different marketing techniques, like in the pre-launch phase, uh, I made a shit ton of memes that I posted all over social media and some of them are really funny. Uh, and the favorite, the favorite, my favorite ones I also put at the bottom of my Kickstarter page. And what I'm doing currently, uh, marketing and promotion wise, which is working surprisingly well, is that for every day the campaign is active uh, on social media, I share one new page of the comic. So it's like day one, page one, and then there, there's like little logos of like Kickstarter and the logo of my comic. And then like in the top corner, there's like funded in two under in under two hours on Kickstarter. And you're like sharing those on all the Facebooks, Twitters, Discords, Reddits, all the social media that I use. What has been the most successful social media platform in terms of getting interaction from people looking at the comic? Surprisingly enough, Reddit. Really? Because with most social media like Facebook, uh, Instagram, and a little bit, but not as much Twitter, um, your engagement levels 
depend heavily on your follower count. So if you have like, I don't know, 10 followers, then you're fucked. Uh, if you've got like, I don't know, a thousand followers, then your posts are going to do a lot better. But on Reddit, that's not the case. It doesn't matter how many followers you have, as long as your content is good. Because there you're sharing on like subreddits, which are something like groups, pretty much. And all the posts are equal. The users vote the posts themselves. And so if a post is good, then people get upvotes and the, the post, the yeah, the post itself is shown more. If people don't like it, it gets downvoted and let fewer people see it. But there, it doesn't matter how many followers you have as long as you have interesting content. Obviously, you know, spamming is never a great oh, process yeah. when it comes to social media. A little faux pas there too, if you decide to try to, to go that route. Well, then let's look at yourself as a, as a creator. You said you've been drawing comics for six years here. What mm -hmm. spurred your creativity in the beginning? Well, it also depends on what you define beginning. Like, do you mean when my parents did the naughties and they came out nine months later? Or do you mean when I first picked up a pencil? Or do you mean when I first started looking for YouTube tutorials on how to draw? Uh, <laughs> but we, we could go back that far if you really wanted to go into that. Right? I have no problem <laughs> with that as long as you're willing to talk about it. But from a creative perspective, then <laughs> let's, let's focus on that. I, I guess I started taking art, illustration, and comics a little bit more seriously when I was in middle school, searching YouTube tutorials on how to draw books, uh, guidebooks, you know, on like different uh, art styles, focusing on, on the basics a bit, bit by bit throughout the years, practicing, maybe doing a couple of like test pages every now and then, you know, like try making some comics here and there, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding. But when I was in high school, I started taking the comic creation itself a lot more seriously. And I started uh, working on my first quote unquote big project, which was Our Name Was Maya. Two and a half years later, uh, I was in comic school and I finished Our Name Was Maya. And I was like, oh, wow, I can actually do something and bring it to completion. This is something that I'm capable of doing. And so after high school, I went to comic school. While I was in comic school, I started Sunrise Blossom. And three years later, still working on it. As a writer and an artist for this particular series here, what was the first experience, early experience, I should say, where you learned that language had power, either in the written word or in the visual medium? I guess it would have to be when I started um, formatting the comic, you know, like from the webtoon form, to the, the traditional page form, you know, like prepare it for print. And I was like, oh, geez, why did I use so many words? Why couldn't I synthesize everything so that the speech bubbles wouldn't be so much of an issue? <laughs> so I guess uh, like I started understanding that better, uh, you know, when like lettering uh, and the lettering of the comic was starting to be a bit of an issue because I couldn't have paragraphs uh, you know, in the in the comic page. And so uh, I started gradually learning how to uh, summarize uh, everything as much as possible and make the speech bubbles as short as possible. And of course, I always try to live by the rule show, don't tell mm -hmm. when it comes to comics. Though sometimes it's a little bit difficult depending on the context. So what was the hardest scene for you to write in volume one and two? Well, in volume one, it probably would have had to be, uh, so minor, minor spoilers. Um, there is an arc in which the main character is held captive. And during this arc, she meets new people. She discovers new parts of herself and she has to deal uh, with this difficult situation the best way she can. And it was particularly hard to write because I needed this arc to last a bit so that it became a more solid part of the story before the rest of the cast uh, found her and came to rescue her pretty much. And so finding ways to show uh, what her daily life there was like and how her interaction with the uh, interactions with the other people there were like without it being boring and, you know, like, what the heck is this? It's not interesting anymore. That, that was pretty difficult to write. Uh, while with the second volume, one of the hardest parts 
to write was the main character's realization that her current living situation could not really go well long term. Uh, so no spoilers, but she has odd living situation and she realizes that she can't stay like that and she has to go back. Uh, understanding how her mental process worked, you know, how to like have her change her mind on everything and understand that this doesn't work well and she has to uh, go back to where she lived before. Uh, it, it, it was difficult, you know, like uh, showing character development, uh, people changing their minds and growing as people is always a bit difficult. So what themes then in these two volumes, you know, spoke to you as a creative person and how did it improve you as as a creative person? Growth, personal growth is something that is very strong in both volumes. Uh, in particularly in volume one, at the end of the story and near the beginning of the story, the character finds herself in similar situations. But because of everything that had happened in volume one, she is able to recognize her previous mistakes and look at the situation from a different point, uh, from a different perspective. So growth is a big theme in the story because it's quite literally a story about a young woman blooming into womanhood. So it's this process from this relatively bratty, <laughs> immature teenager who grows into a mature, strong, understanding woman. Family uh, is also that it, something that is recurring and very important in the story itself. How um, the main character relates to her family, her adoptive family, her biological family, her new family, uh, pretty much uh, from near the beginning of the first uh, volume, and how the relationships she has with very different people uh, in her family is very different. So like the way she acts around her sister, the way she acts around her uh, mother, the way she acts around her brother, the way she acts around her father figure, they're all very different, but they're also all very realistic, or at least I tried to make it uh, realistic because most of her relationships, I tried to model on my own relationships with family, friends, and, and so forth. So what has been your, your family's reaction to your comic? Uh, oh, very supportive. Uh, my mother <laughs> has been, and grandmother <laughs> technically, have been supporters, uh, like some of the very first supporters of my Patreon. And even on both the Indiegogo campaign for volume one, and on the Kickstarter campaign for volume one and two, uh, my mother was like my biggest, one of my biggest supporters. And like, I'm, I'm really thankful for that because uh, it shows that she likes what I do and she uh, you know, believes that uh, what I'm doing is pretty good and like pushing me and motivating me to go on. Uh, though I don't think many of my family members have noticed how the main character's relationships to people in her family is kind of modeled after my own, but that's okay. Maybe after seeing this, they will. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How did you balance making demands on the reader with taking care of the reader? What was their reaction? Re not regarding that specific arc, but did they make their own suggestions? Did that influence yourself as a creative person? Or did you have this, uh, these stories already in mind and you really didn't do too much tweaking? Luckily, I, uh, I didn't really get any suggestions uh, from readers, friends, and fans. One thing that did kind of cause me to change the story a bit because of readers and, and fans and stuff was the fate of one of the characters. Hmm. So there is a character that I really, really dislike. Like, I hate her guts so much for no real reason. I, I just like, I don't know. I just, I, I just like her. And so my plan in the first volume was to kill her off, hmm. you know, and like serve for some character growth for the main character because yay trauma. Apparently she was the favorite character of a lot of people. I was like, oh no, oh no, oh no. I changed the fact that she died into the main character thinks she died, but she didn't really. And actually keeping her alive made 
the solving of a particularly difficult plot point a lot easier. So that was actually for the best. And when it comes for uh, arcs that maybe I have to lengthen a little bit, I try to keep it as entertaining as possible by not keeping things still. If like the characters are like stuck working uh, as maids in a house, for example, I'm not going to show 30 pages of them cleaning the house. This is going to be boring. But I uh, like I showed scene of scenes of them uh, getting to know each other, other characters sharing their experiences and the main character relating to those experiences. And then like having things constantly change, like the main character maybe does something bad while working and receives punishment for it. Interactions with previously introduced characters that had disappeared for a while. And I, I try to add things and have everything constantly moving so that the, the reader is not, you know, like... <sighs> And like puts the book down and moves on to something else. Nameology is always interesting when it comes to character creation and, and character names and everything like that because it's very it's either subconscious or it actively is part of your creative process. People are different all all over the years. In the past thirteen years, they've I've I've seen, heard some really crazy stories as to how creators create the names of their characters. I so have some good ones. Oh, then how did you create the names of your characters? Well, um, before I focus on the character's actual name, there is a, like a really nice little Easter egg that not many people notice, but a few have. The main character, Ivy, uh, her family nickname, so the way her mother calls her affectionately, is Blossom. Her younger sister, uh, her adoptive sister, has a bit of a bubbly personality, and she is a boobo owl. And her nickname is Boobles. And she has a younger brother called Buttercup. So you've got Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup. Does that ring a bell? Uh, yeah, it sounds a lot like, I don't know, one of my favorite little superhero genres called the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, there was that little Easter egg uh, that I enjoyed. Another naming point that I really, really enjoyed the relationship of the name between the main character, Ivy, and her biological mother, whose name is Pamela. So we have Pamela and we have Ivy. And I don't know how familiar you are with Batman. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But absolutely. there is a redhead who, like the main character and her mother, are both redheads, whose name is Pamela and whose... Um, Poison Ivy. Exactly. Wow, that is, I, I am truly amazed. I love it. I, I <laughs> think you. that's, that is the most creative way uh, someone has ever named their characters. I, I do, I, you, you have shocked me. Here's my job. <laughs> that, that's amazing. I love it. Truly. Thank you. <laughs> now all you need is someone owning an ice cream store and just his last name of Freeze and you're all set. <laughs> yeah, maybe add a girl called Harleen or something like that. Sure. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> It sounds like you have a few influences that that I'm familiar with for sure as well too in in the superhero genre. What is your favorite comic or or medium of any kind that is underappreciated? As a person who publishes a lot on the webtoon platform, uh, I have a lot of friends who are indie creators on webtoons. And there are so many series there that are like breathtakingly amazing. And like the art is amazing. The story is amazing. And it's like, wow. But like, they don't have a lot of followers because it's a bit of an oversaturated uh, market uh, on Webtoon because so many people post uh, on Webtoon. And maybe because they're not very familiar with, with marketing and don't know how to do it very well. They're kind of like stuck in like a low follower limbo. Uh, but there are so many of those indie stories that are absolutely amazing. As far as indie stories go, there are also like many of like the original professional comics on Webtoons that are really good, but I don't think have the backing that they should because of how amazing they are. Anyone in particular or any, any few that come to mind? 
Uh, one that comes to mind is Seven and the Webs of Truth. Sorry, and the Web of Truth, which is a story about the spider who lost one arm. And so he just thinks he's a bug with an extra arm. He lives with, with other bugs and it's really cute. The art is, is really cute and the story is like entertaining and it's like a really good uh, all, for all ages story. Another one that I really like on Webtoons is Them Beyond Human and is this alien sci-fi story. Uh, and it's like, it's, it's really interesting. And the art is so good it's so good it's like holy crap dude how much time did you spend on these and like still be able to like publish them regularly because they're so good and when it comes to you know more traditional like print indie comics i really enjoy the life on quora series Mm -hmm. uh which uh and the fifth volume of that series is currently on on indiegogo life on quora five Every single volume uh, focuses on a different species uh, that lives on this alien planet called Korra. They're all really cute. Uh, I don't really know how else to put it. Like, I think it's underappreciated because it's a bit of a niche. It deserves a lot more uh, than what I think it's getting. Something's off to check out then for sure. Yeah. We can't always be creative all the time. We, we do have our off days every so often. Um, do you believe in a creative block? Yes and no. Like there's different ways uh, of interpreting creative block, I guess, because like even myself, when it comes to maybe writing and scripting, like I'm, I'm a bit stuck. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I-, I dug myself into this hole. How do I get out now? And then it's like wrenching, like squeezing my brain to find a solution. And it's really, really difficult. And some it, it happens because I'm more of an artist than I am a writer. I do also understand how for many creators, burnout is a really big uh, risk. And so learning to balance work uh, and rest and fun and all the other things is really important to avoid burnout. And it's one of the things that I see uh, rookie creators, new creators do wrong all the time. So I meet uh, new creators, I don't know, every week. And so many of them like lose motivation because they burn out after like just a couple of months. Going to go a little more introspective. Before I get into my more introspective questions, is there anything I haven't touched on? And we'll, we'll talk about social media and where we can find the Kickstarter and all that other stuff as well too. Um, towards the end of the interview uh, that I haven't touched on. You'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview. Well, I guess one thing that I am really proud of when it comes to Sunrise Blossom is how I was able to tackle um, pretty much LGBT issues, you know, like mostly like understanding one's sexuality, coming to terms uh, with it and relating to other people who are different. I, I tried to, and I, I think I did it rather well, if I may say so myself, uh, showing those aspects realistically. Like it's not uh, that, of course, it's not that everyone is gay, but also it's not that everyone is straight. And I try to have a realistic balance uh, of that in the portrayal uh, of the characters in my comic. And I think it's, it's something that m- more, more people who maybe do works with LGBT themes should do because many of them I feel are a bit forced and not realistic. And this is something that I think is, is well-balanced and anyone can enjoy. How has the comic helped you in your life then? Well, I, I wouldn't really know. Like, uh, it's helped me relate to a lot more people. It's helped me meet a lot of people. Um, it's helped me network with a lot more more people, and also it's helped me a lot grow uh, professionally. And it's something that I'm really grateful for that I've worked really hard for, and I'm happy to be able to gradually reap what I've been sowing. At what point are we good enough? Oh, I say we are good enough when we are content. And if you are not content, then sometimes you have to learn to make do and be content with what you have. 
because not everyone is going to be able to have everything they need. And while it's important to achieve and to be able to grasp as much as you can the things that you need, it's important to compromise. And if you're not content, then look at what you're missing, work on that and try to improve what you can. And I say you are enough when you are content with what you've got. Though it's also important to understand that being enough doesn't mean it's good to stop because being enough, as I mentioned, I feel is about how content you are with yourself, but it's also important to keep striving to improve, you know, like both yourself, your art, your craft, because if you don't also work on that, then you'll be stuck. What is one thing you wish to accomplish before you die? If this were a question that you had asked me maybe four years ago, my answer probably would have been to bring my comic to completion. But the comic that I was working on four years ago has successfully come to completion. And I am honestly pretty satisfied with my life right now. Like I don't really have any regrets. And it's something that I strive to maintain pretty much. Like if I feel I would regret something, then let's fix that because that's not good. I can't really say that like I maybe I want to like be published or maybe I want to, I don't know, have a Netflix deal because those are kind of unrealistic a little bit. Well, not unrealistic, but like if I strive for those because of how difficult they are to achieve, then I might just be unsatisfied for the rest of my life. Uh, I created a story I like, uh, about several stories that, that I like. I've created a cast of characters that I personally really enjoy. I shared them with the world. People have liked them and that's good enough for me. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? Uh, probably to stick my head out of my ass because my shit isn't golden. Because <laughs> there are so many creators. Like, like maybe like um, if you're in high school and maybe like you're the only like artsy person in your group, then uh, like you compare your art to what your other uh, like classmates and friends create and you see it so much better than theirs. And so you think, oh, I'm a genius. Wow, I am such an amazing artist. And then you like go to art school and it's like, nope. <laughs> so yeah, get your head out of your ass. Your shit isn't golden. Keep working to improve. If maybe it's not going to be golden, but bronze is pretty good. <laughs> uh, and it's going to get better if you keep working on it. That is, that is the best phrase I have ever heard. I have ever, <laughs> I w so the big cat managed to open the door and let in the small one, which was nice. what I was trying to avoid, but it's okay. here she done. is. Yeah. Aww. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, someone who has inspired me. Um, it might be a little bit cliche, but perhaps my mother, because ever since I was young, she's always been doing a million different things. Like in the nineties, she had like an internet company and then she sold it and then she moved and bought like this big house in Italy, uh, with the money from selling the company. And then she started a mosaic supply business uh, and then she started renting villas to tourists and then she started making uh, like handbag accessories like she's been doing like, like a, a lot of different things and she's been like really good at doing all of the things she's done so far and like seeing her work excel at everything that she wanted to do as even her passions changed and fluctuated in, in life and having this person who ever since I was small was always a very creative influence because we always had the house filled uh, with her mosaics. Uh, it, it made me feel like it was okay to be creative and like, yeah, I want to be like that too. And so it, it was like a, a starting point for me. She's always like supported me uh, 
artistically and creatively through all of my endeavors. So yeah, I'd say maybe my mom. From a professional perspective, you have created two volumes of the comic. You are now creating more, or you will create more, I should say. You've done many other things in your life artistically, whether it's writing or being an artist itself, and you're being noticed and people are supporting you in the various ways that they are. So from a professional standpoint, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I would say almost. Uh, I would say almost mostly because it's, uh, it, it's a journey. It's been a journey and it's going to continue being a journey. Aside from the fact that success is relevant, like if, uh, if I look at my numbers now compared to uh, my numbers and how I was as a person five years ago, I would be like, yeah, you're successful. Awesome. <laughs> but also I would say almost successful because I, I still struggle to pay bills, I guess. <laughs> So I say I would be successful when my bills and my rent and my grocery shopping, uh, I can pay without checking how much I have on my bank account first. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, I try not to um, pine over them much because pining over failure gets you nowhere. Like you, if, if you're like wallowing in self-pity, then like I understand having to like express emotion and like get it out for a bit. But if you stay in that state, you're going nowhere. I've gone through several steps of failure in my life, especially creatively. The biggest one currently, at least the most recent one being the fact that I started my comic in completely in black and white with a completely new style that I was not very familiar with just yet because I like tried experimenting with a different style than I usually used. There are some parts at the beginning of Sunrise Blossom where it's wonky and like even online, like on, on webtoons, like that wasn't working very well at all. I learned from those experiences. I learned to adapt. I learned, you know, through a lot of trial and error, what worked, what didn't. I don't, I don't really agree that failure is the opposite of success because you can't really consider yourself successful if you haven't been able to fail and learn from those experiences because even if maybe you have i don't know a thousand followers if you're not learning anything you're not moving forward you're going to be stuck with those and you're not going to be able to earn more well if maybe a person who has i don't know like the similar numbers maybe a person has 200 followers makes mistakes but they're able to understand from the mistakes that like keep them stuck there and are able to work on those mistakes so that their numbers like go up and up and up and up. And of course, numbers isn't everything. I just like using them to like make a comparison. So like failures are ne failure is necessary to learn because otherwise you're not going anywhere. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or an artist or whatever they would like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Social change is a big thing. If it weren't for the social change that happened in the past 10 years, my comic would probably not exist because it's sad to say, but almost everyone was homophobic in like 2008. Like if you open a, 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 like a comedy movie, if you watch a comedy movie from the early 2000s, there's a lot of really bad like gay jokes in there, which are like not there anymore in move, not nearly as much or in the same way. Uh, as in movies today. And because of how uh, society and what's considered acceptable and what's not considered acceptable in society changed, uh, it also changed my way of doing comics. Like if it weren't for social change like that, my comic would have been a lot more different. The themes would have been a lot more different. And so if the type of work that I do might inspire future creators, they might also be inspired by the waves of social change uh, that are molding the world around them. And I think that is something that can also be said for comics, maybe even 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, how they reflect the world around them and how um, the changes happening in society molded their, their work. So I guess the same could be said 
for creators 30 years in the future. But I do hate to say this, unfortunately, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived. Aww. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Nina. I do greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was really enjoyable. Before I let you go, though, where can we find you? How can we support you on social media? And, and where can we find the Kickstarter? Well, if you search Sunrise Blossom on Kickstarter, you'll find it right there. Uh, it's live until February 14th, but fear not because after the campaign, oh, sorry, Epinino. after the campaign is over, I am opening an Etsy store where I'll be sharing the, the same products. The only thing being though that shipping uh, and some of the products would be a little bit more expensive on Etsy than they are on Kickstarter. And I've got a link tree. Uh, so if you go on linktr.ee slash Nina D. Aberline, you'll find all my social media. So there you can find my Kickstarter, my Patreon, my Webtoon, my Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, TikTok, newsletter, Tapas, Discord, Fur Affinity, and Facebook. And a kitchen sink as well. <laughs> <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree there you go. Even better. <laughs> well nia thank you so much for coming on the show i do greatly appreciate it i'd love to have you back on in the future so by all means yeah. please, please stop by and and i'll get some other questions for you to answer and we'll see what else is ticking up there in your wonderfully creative mind and i can't wait to see what happens in volume three of of course sunrise blossom which is all scripted out. I'm already working on the storyboards and start working uh, on the creation of the comic itself. Like I said, though, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>